So what if we didn't need money to survive? Hallelujah. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm serious. What if we didn't need money to buy clothing, food, pay for housing, education, transportation, utilities, healthcare, governments and institutions, even to maintain our fellowship? What if we could live a life in which money wasn't needed at all? Can you imagine? No. <laughs> Well, 26-year-old Trumpy lived such a life in a remote part of the Amazon rainforest. His indigenous group, the Achor, had lived without money for thousands of years. They raised families, built homes, fed and educated themselves, and they maintained communities without any money. As global activist and fundraiser Lynn Twist says in her book, the soul of money. Reciprocity was the social currency. It was understood that everyone shared with everyone else and everyone took care of everyone else. People built each other homes, they helped care for each other's children, they cooked communally, and when one of the hunters brought back a large kill, it was shared among the whole community. Disagreements were around matters of honor and character rather than resources. So when the Achua were first exposed to missionaries in the early 1970s, their worldview was unfortunately turned upside down. Within two decades, their land became the target of oil companies and other commercial enterprises. And then one day, an American land developer arrived to come and buy their land. In response, Chumpi was chosen by the elders to go to America and study English and help them figure out how to save their ancestral lands. And Chumpi not only had to learn English in America, but he had to learn, as Lynn Twist tells us, the other language of contemporary Western life, the language of money. money a language where nearly everyone and everything is driven constantly and sometimes exclusively by money. So he quickly began to learn the meaning of money in America and he was surprised to understand that almost every choice we make, every choice, including our relationships and even having children, as well as our dreams and hopes, are influenced by money. Just think about it. Almost everything we do has money somewhere in the background. And the Achor soon realized that if they had any chance of resisting the force of money and keeping their ancestral lands, they needed to hold on to their core values. They needed to let their highest commitments to life and land, guide their decisions, and not be tempted by this strange but powerful thing called money. Resolutely steered by their values, they managed to hold on to their lands, I'm glad to say, and to their way of life. They didn't need money in their ecosystem. But if they were to leave and enter the world outside, they would soon have nothing for food or shelter, and they'd likely become homeless. The philosopher economist Charles Eisenstein talks in his book, Sacred Economics, about how our world might transform if money wasn't its driver. He argues that money has become a god in our lives. Money has no intrinsic value in itself. Like God, we don't necessarily see it, but we believe in its power. Now, some money appears on printed bits of worthless paper, equivalent in actual value to pieces of tissue. Or it materializes simply as numbers on a computer screen. But the days of money having actual intrinsic worth, like gold coins, is mostly over. So Eisenstein says money is actually just an agreement. It only has 
value because people, we all, agree that it has. And yet money has tremendous power and drives everything we do. Almost all our wars are fought over money and resources. And most violence to people on the earth happens because of excessive greed in pursuit of money. So Eisenstein suggests that if we were to move to a gift economy, such as the Atuar used, a life in which we all share our gifts and mutually take care of one another, we could live much more contented and peaceful lives. We could connect more profoundly to our real purpose for being alive. And we could treat the earth and each other more kindly. The challenge, he cites, is that as societies monetize, communities disappear. You have to need each other. You have to need each other. So he invites us to move from a society separated by money to a reciprocal society of interconnectedness, one in which we are all linked. Now, our fellowship has many of the attributes of that kind of society, one that it might look like without money. We take care of each other, no matter how old or how young or what we look like or what, color, what the color is of our skin or whom we love or what gender we might identify with. We accept one another, not for how much money we have, but because we're all inherently worthy of love, rich or poor, healthy or sick, strong or tired. So we have many of the wise characteristics of the Atua right here, except that we live in the Western industrialized world in which money is needed for survival. So that's why we have to ask you for money every year for our beloved community to survive and thrive. We're part of a capitalist system, which means that these buildings, these lights, this air conditioning, these programs, this staff, this food, all need to be fed by money. Now, my ministry is deeply meaningful to me. It's my deepest life calling. But unfortunately, for us to survive in this economy, most of us can't work for free, even when we love what we do. We're all so deeply embedded in a culture of money that we can hardly see its effect on our daily lives. It's like fish swimming in the ocean who don't notice the water that they're swimming in. In our money-driven society, money is employed to control life and promote particular agendas. It's used to acquire as much as we can in a zero-sum game, dividing us into haves and have-nots. Money is used to assert power, to bribe, to coerce, to convert, to manipulate, and destroy. And it's often used to fill a limitless void within. If only we could buy that one thing, then we would be happy, right? Or if only we could get out of debt, then we would be finally free and contented. Money is used to establish hierarchies among us that separate us from one another, rich from poor. And the elephant in the room here is, as in most places, that the people who give more money also have more power. Because everything in our culture needs money to survive. Yet beneath the capitalist system and the way money divides us, I believe we all mostly want the same thing, don't we? We want to love and be loved. We want a happy, healthy life for everyone to live peacefully. We hope there's enough for everyone to have enough food, 
and shelter. And we yearn for our lives to have meaning and purpose and to make a difference, don't we? So if that's what we're hoping to achieve, I believe there has to be another way. What if we could reframe money to serve in a spiritually fulfilling, sacred way? What if our money, at least in this community, could be used to connect rather than separate us? What if right here we could create a sacred economy in which we use our gifts and money to heal, to empower, to link, and to provide? To heal, empower, link, and provide. Does anyone know what that spells? Yes, you got it. It spells help. Like that? Anyone hearing a familiar Lennon McCartney tune ringing in their heads? Help, I need somebody. So what does help actually look like? In this fellowship, money helps create a space for healing. Money rents this beautiful sanctuary. It pays our mortgage for our fellowship hall, for our utilities and staff so that we can hold worship and classes and live our mission here seven days a week. And attending worship helps heal our wounds of disassociation, of loneliness, of emptiness and meaninglessness in our lives. Our coming together in this beautiful space helps us glim glimpse the sacredness of life. Just think about how you are receiving healing here by coming here. Is it in our chalice circles or our women's and men's groups or other circles? Is it in our LGBTQ youth group or through our social justice work? Everything we do here helps us have a more connected and meaningful experience of life. Our pastoral care team also meets with me regularly to figure out who in our community needs healing, assistance, who needs prayer, who needs visits or meals. My friends, when you give to this community, you are helping heal each other and the world. And E stands for, who remembers? Empower. That's right. How do we empower with money, with our money? Well, our youth group and children's education classes meet weekly to teach our children how to make a difference in the world and learn about cultures and religions different to theirs. We are proudly raising peace and justice builders. In fact, just last month, one of our youth spoke at our climate forum, and you've heard our amazing young people lead services and inspire you, haven't you? They're incredible. Meanwhile, our whole lives classes teach kids how to have responsible, loving relationships and be empowered around their sexuality. We empower adult members to learn and to grow and to treat each other more lovingly and with integrity through our covenant of right relations. And our beloved conversations classes helping us address issues around race and be empowered to be allies for racial justice. Our community forums empower us by stimulating our thinking and expanding our understanding of issues affecting our world from climate change to LGBTQ concerns to health care and race relations. At this fellowship, we are being empowered to be better stewards of our earth and kinder, more loving, neighbors. When you give to this community, you are empowering yourself, each other, and our world. Which brings me to how we link with money. Now, by link, I really mean connect, but that didn't fit into my acronym, so go with me on this one. How can we use money to connect? As soon as we share our money with one another by co-investing in this fellowship, we're connecting each other. We're sharing our resources to create a community that thrives, 
We get to connect across generations, with different people, across various viewpoints, whom we might never know otherwise. And in this increasingly isolating and divided world, we are learning the value of connection and living our seventh UU principle of honoring our interconnectedness. My friends, when you give to this community, you are helping link us all together. So lastly, how can we use money to provide? Thank you. Well, we have an active social justice program that provides food for the homeless, that advocates for the marginalized, that serves the community as an interfaith partner, and as informed allies where needed. We provide a spiritual home to anyone that anyone can attend, member or not. And we provide and protect our young and raise them to be open-minded, thoughtful, caring individuals. So when you give to this community, you are taking on the honor, the honor of providing for our children, for each other, and for our world. So if we, if we share our resources generously with this fellowship, our money is being used for good, my friends, to help one another, to help one another flourish, to help the earth heal, to help our wider community feel loved and cared for. And I want to share with you what a few congregants recently shared with me about why this place is so special to them. This is what they said. This place affects every aspect of my life. It feeds a spiritual need I didn't know I had as an atheist. It gives me a sense of purpose to make this community thrive. The more involved we become and the more we give, and the more we give, the more involved we want to be. We try to pledge as much as we can because we want to see what we can be. And then someone else said, This community fills my spirit. My chosen family and friends are here. I give of both my time and treasure because I love what we do here. And the more I give to this community, the more I get and the more I give out there. I get inspired to be generous in my life. In fact, when I'm gone a few weeks in a row, I, I feel an ache. I, I might sometimes come to two services, even after working a night shift. <laughs> and another one said, I need a community around me. And being supportive back to that community makes me feel alive and like I'm doing my share. When I'm away, I think about what's happening. It's happening back here at the fellowship. I don't want to miss anything. And someone else said, This place feeds my soul. It's been here for me in great times and tough times. I'm surrounded by strong, supportive people who inspire and help me when the going gets tough. It means so much to me that I hate to miss church. And finally, This is my community my extended family, my home. I learn the value of giving here and become more generous everywhere. My friends, this place means the world to us, doesn't it? Yes. Doesn't it? Yes. It's precious. You know that. I know that. It's so very near and dear to all of our hearts. And it's important in the wider community, too. We are the shareholders of this vision to nurture spiritually courageous people who transform the world through justice and compassion. What we share to make this happen matters. Now, I know you know that. You know that for our community to thrive in our monetized world, we continue to need your investment of time, talent, and treasure. 
But rather than thinking of it as a transaction, I invite you to look at it as a long-term investment with love, meaning, and connection as the primary long-term capital gain. What could be better than that? Love, meaning, and connection. So you're not paying for a service or attending a performance or just joining a social club. No, this is an investment in a more fulfilling, caring, and contented future. You're investing in a better world for yourselves and others by sharing your financial gifts as abundantly as you can with this fellowship. Collectively, you own this place and all it does for everyone. Every single one of our members owns this amazing fellowship. So my husband and I are so inspired by this fellowship that we're going to raise our pledge again this year. And I'm so inspired by Jason that we're going to have to see what that looks like. But we're certainly going to raise it significantly for us. Even though my family's expenses are high, I believe that this is the right thing to do. Now, a minister's job is so unusual because we actually give back a portion of our salary to our employers, our shareholders. Not from monetary shares, but for shares in bringing more healing, compassion, and justice to the world. Because I believe in this community and what we do here. I want to help it flourish, and it feels good. As your minister, I see the money doing so much good seven days a week in so many people's lives. And I figure my contribution here is so much more impactful than spreading it out over many larger nonprofits who have a much wider donor base than we do. Investing my money here is like giving to a socially conscious mutual fund. Except we're a spiritually responsible mutual fund of goodness and growth. We're a mutual fund that invests in hearts and minds and souls. Everyone being served by this fellowship is where our returns grow exponentially. And we're all in this together. Every dime we invest here is used to help. Repeat after me. To heal, to, heal. To, empower, to empower, to link, to link. And, to and to provide. Everything we invest here helps us create and sustain a community that blesses the world. So my friends, I invite you to invest with me. <coughs> Join me in raising your pledges with pride. Give so that you can feel proud of what you're giving. Share what makes you feel generous. Give so that you can feel joy in your gift. Share so that you can create a small but necessary corner of the world where money does nothing but good. Where money does nothing but spread love. Like the Achor, I invite you to reflect on your core values and your highest commitments to life. And let them be your sacred guide to your giving. Who do you want to be? Who do we want to be? What we do with our money, where we invest it, is who we are and who we will become. Please join me in helping this precious fellowship thrive. You can make it so. Blessed be.